Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and happy Friday. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. We talked about sandwiches. We did. I will talk about sandwiches all day long. Mm-hmm. Um, here's an interesting thing that came up. Um, we talked at the end in the Reuben origin story about Elizabeth Weil or Wheel. I don't know how she pronounces it, so my apologies if it's wrong. And she wrote several of the articles that I was reading because she had her own, like, sort of dramatic play out of what happened when she initially shared her family's story, which is that a food historian named Andrew Smith, who has written a lot of food histories, reached out and was kind of like, you are wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, And then she and her husband, and particularly her husband, really started to dig until they could find a primary source, which is why we know that the oldest one is from 1934, because Mm -hmm. he got the Nebraska Historical Society, I think, involved, and they found one in their archives. Um, And I... I was taken aback a little bit because she very much shares this entire story of their disagreement and how it played out. And I'm like, I I wouldn't do that. I'd be too scared. But uh, it's interesting. And listen, I'm just glad we have a Reuben sandwich. That's all, mm-hmm. that's all I need. That's all I need. Uh, we were going to talk about how we both dislike Sloppy Joes. I hate them. <laughs> I hate them, too. <laughs> uh. This, they were a staple in my household growing up. Like, there was just, there was sort of a rotation of the things that we regularly ate for dinner. And Sloppy Joe's was in the rotation. And I was like, I hate this. This is effectively chili on a bun. Well, but there's no beans. There are chilies that don't have beans at all. All of these foods are on my no-fly list. So yes. I- <laughs> so, um, I, I hate it that you bite into it and the stuff comes out everywhere. And I hated how it made the bun wet. I just hated it. And it... Um, <laughs> And unlike Holly, I did not have a viscerally negative reaction to the idea of chili. I was always like, why don't we just have chili and not this hamburger bun to go with it? Right. Um, And my mom would make chili that she would serve over rice. Like, there were other ways to make the chili stretch with some, or, you know, whatever. The meat and sauce stretch with some kind of sauce at our house, whether it was spaghetti with spaghetti sauce or chili over rice or whatever. And I was just always like, like, I ate it. Why do this version when other options are available? Right. It wasn't like I hated it enough to have a standoff with my mother, which I did with some other foods that I could not deal with. But I was just, I was like, I don't understand why we were, we are choosing to have this obviously inferior presentation of meat and tomato sauce. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't like them at all. I don't like messiness. And we didn't mention in the episode, but like some people do theirs much sweeter and include like barbecue sauce. I think some of the earliest like newspaper write ups before mm-hmm. there were canned sloppy joe sauces on the market were like, you can use a little tomato paste and barbecue sauce, which you can, I guess, if this is your jam. I don't like any of it. Look, it's messy. I don't want sloppy, sticky glorp on me. Right. No, thank you. <laughs> it's just occurred to me that these objections that I have to Sloppy Joe's, I do not have over, like, a pulled pork barbecue sandwich. Because the por- the pulled pork holds together in a way that ground beef in a sauce does not. Yeah, ground beef and, like, loose meat sandwiches, no. Just... No. Open face it and melt cheese on top and we'll get closer. And yeah. then I might be willing to eat it. But I also don't want it sweet. No. Dad, if you're listening to this, please don't play it for mom. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, my hat is off to anybody who cooks for anybody. And if someone cooks me a homemade meal, even if it's something I don't like, I will eat it because I appreciate that they took the time to do it. But this would never be my first choice. I will never make it in my home myself. 
I don't think I have had a sloppy joe since leaving my parents' home to live on my own. I'm trying to remember. It's been a long time. A very long time. Um, yeah, I just don't love it. Um, you know, I I love um, a hot brown. Mm-hmm. I love. Of course, that's another one that, like, you don't pick up. You eat it with a fork and a knife because it's it's a big mess. Um, and it feels sort of in that same genre as like a croque monsieur to me. And Just, I do like a croque monsieur. Oh, I love a croque monsieur. You make it a croque madame and I'm all over it. Same. Fried egg on top. Yeah. I love, I love, I love. But I do like a hot brown and it made me want to make them. Um, do you remember, I didn't remember and my memory was jogged in an article, but I didn't have time to like go chase it down, right? We talked about uh, the introduction of the Manwich brand sauce, Mm -hmm. which inherently has had some problems Mm -hmm. (laughs) of it being somehow a gendered sandwich. Yeah, weirdly gendered (laughs) for some reason. And they had an ad campaign not that long ago, but I don't remember. I mean, it's been a a little while that was kind of like hyper-masculine in its thing and suggesting that like if men did not like this sandwich, there was something wrong with them or whatever and i they pulled it very quickly because people were like what are you doing Mm -hmm. um to their credit they immediately pulled it but i'm still like how did that ever make it to air i don't yeah um, i remember like manwich ads when i was a kid being on tv having a weird like i was like why is it sandwiched for men i don't understand (laughs) a lot clearly i'm just not understanding about sloppy chips yeah me either um i'm with you i don't get the appeal i don't but I do know people that love them, so. We also mentioned that I wanted to talk about the reviews of the newly opened, newly in the last 10 years, Sloppy Joe's in Havana. Yeah. If you go, like, on TripAdvisor and you read the reviews, they are so disparately polarized that it sounds like some people are going to the real Sloppy Joe's Uh and some people might be going to a different place that's using the same name because they don't sound like the same place at all. Oh, wow. And I don't know if that's the case, but, like, some of them are like, oh, my gosh, this was such an elegant meal. It was incredible. Like, I loved it. It's a bar, but, like, the cocktails are amazing and the the food was really good. And it's I'm so glad that the Historic Society brought this back. And then others are like, the only thing they have on the menu is tuna. And I'm like, what? Um, hmm. Like, I really don't know what's going on there where these are so completely disparate. But mm-hmm. should I get to Havana, I'm going to find out. Okay, we have not talked about the jewel of discovery in the research. Okay. Um, I mentioned in the episode, I don't remember which of us talked about it, um, that there was a book that came out in 1932, which is the cocktail menu Mm, mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. instructions for the Havana Sloppy Joes. And this book is fully available online in digital form. Nice. Like where they have scanned the whole book in uh, on a site that does a lot of old cocktail books. And it is such a jewel. Um, because it has a lot of interesting cocktail recipes in it, if you're into that. But here, there is also a drink in it called the Sloppy Joe. Oh, wow. Okay. Which sounds far more interesting to me than the sandwich. I also don't like ropa vieja or... Uh-huh. <laughs> I clearly have a problem with, like, shredded or ground meat that is kind of... I don't dislike either of those inherently, but there's something about in a sauce, it becomes... I'm like, what else is in this sauce? Like, I just... I'm not trusting, apparently. You're not really into soups either. Oh, no! I do not like gloopy food. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Um... It's bisque or bust. I was just telling my friend Kristen. It has to be very thick and very creamy, and I have to know who made it. I don't know why I'm very weird about it. Um, Because I will literally eat food off the floor sometimes. I don't don't know why. This is the place where I'm persnickety. Um, But (laughs) not just, like, I'm not wandering around the earth going, look, food on the floor. But if I drop a thing, I'll sometimes eat it. Um, Anyway, the drink called a Sloppy Joe, which I have not made yet, but I'm absolutely going to, is one part pineapple juice, one part cognac and one part port wine. 
with a few drops of grenadine and curacao, and you shake it with cracked ice, and then you serve it in a tall glass. And that sounds really interesting to me, and I'm going to make it. I'm making a puzzled face, but it's just like there just kept being more... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What is your puzzlement? I don't, it's, uh, I don't know, they're just, it started with pineapple, and I was like, okay, and I think my brain kind of built out a drink from there, and it was not the, then the list of things that you were you expecting said. a tiki drink and not yeah. cognac and wine in it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I actually think this sounds pretty darn good. I'm gonna, I'll report back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> with the Sloppy Joe cocktail. But I kind of just want to make a bunch of drinks from that book because they there are a lot of interesting ones. That sounds um, fun. Which put me in the mind of, I was like, oh, this is why Ernest Hemingway like this. Listen, we all know Ernest Hemingway loved to drink. Um, do you know what a death in the afternoon is? <laughs> I I I, um, I feel like yes, but I'm not, it's not gelling with the answer. It is um, a cocktail that is generally some um, people say Hemingway invented this. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, it is half sh- by some measures. You'll see different measures included. Some will say it is half champagne, half absinthe. And some will say it is just like a flute of champagne and then like you do a jigger of absinthe. But jiggers come in all sizes. So like depending on how big your flute is, you're already into into it. But it's a lot. And I'm mm-hmm. like, whoo. I mean, that's good for a once in a while. But I was like, oh, no wonder Hemingway likes sloppy joes. They made a lot of interesting drinks. Mm-hmm. Now we know. Now we know. And then he just imported it into Key West in his own version. This all makes sense to me. I want a Reuben so bad right now. I can't yeah. even... I don't think I've ever eaten one. Um, it's it's just uh, corned beef and sauerkraut and Thousand Island dressing. It's Thousand Island, right? These just weren't ingredients that we had around the house, right? But like you, I've been to delis with you. I know you've had access. I have. <laughs> uh, so here's kind of a funny story. Uh, my dad goes to visit like his one living aunt. Mm-hmm. at the community where she lives. And that is what they get every time. Because <gasps> it's the um, best one. And I think there have been at least two times that I have been visiting my parents and there has been a plan that I'm going to accompany dad on this visit. We're all going to get Rubens. And then every time something has gone wrong and like either the visit hasn't happened or I have needed to stay with my mom or something like that. Yeah, I don't, it's, I think it's just one of those things similarly to, like, a Cobb salad where since I never really had one growing up, by the time I became an adult and was in restaurants that served sandwiches and salads and stuff, I already had other sandwiches and salads that are favorites. I do like to try new foods. I mean, that's not something I am I shy away from doing ever. Right. But uh, when it comes to things like a salad or a sandwich or whatever, a lot of times, like, there's a thing that's the thing that I want, and I stick with that. I'm going to totally get a Reuben, though. You've convinced me I should try I one. I hope you like it. If you don't, save it, freeze it. I'll eat it when we're together next. I don't, I let no Reuben be left behind. That's okay. funny. I love I'll them bring so it on the plane much. with me to Iceland. <laughs> Ugh, I mean, yeah, I'll do it. Speaking of which, is a good time to mention we're going to Iceland. We again. are going to Iceland. The first week of November, mm-hmm. uh, the second to the eighth. If you would like to go, this is in in the the next in the series of our fun international trips that we've been doing each year, almost, except the pandemic messed up that whole plan. Um we're going to Iceland. We're going to spend some time in Reykjavik and some time in Vik. Mm-hmm. And we're going to uh, eat interesting things and visit historical places. And you can come to, you can do that at defineddestinations.com. That's defineddestinations.com. Uh, and it should be right there on the, the main page where it says Iceland. I, I mailed in my mail-in voting application. So oh, I'm yeah. set for that. You are set. Yes, it happens during... Uh, the election here in the U.S., so be mindful if you want to sign up that that may be part of the situation. Part of the Um, planning. 
Yeah, you want to you wanna plan ahead for that, but we uh, envision a very good time, and you can get all the details there on the Defined Destination website. This week, we talked about Marjorie Courtney Latimer and the coelacanth. Sure did. Boy, do I love her. She's great. I, yeah, I love her uh, tromping around in... Uh, repurposed nursing uniform and stockings, ripping those stockings all to shreds, doing her naturalist work. I would not wear stockings to do that or a dress. Uh, but the fact that she was absolutely a door, uh, the fact that a man was like, yeah, I want to marry you, but you can't be doing this naturalist thing. And and she was like, Adios, um, muchacho. <laughs> we're breaking up then. I love that. Uh, don't love the fact that when she did finally find somebody that seemed to really support these interests, that he died. That was very sad. Of course. Uh, But I I love her. Um, I tried to track down as much as I could about her uh, relationships with the, uh, like, the indigenous population of Southern Africa, because that whole thing is really fraught, obviously, um, and ethnographic collections and museums can also be really fraught, but based on everything I was able to find, it does seem like uh, that she was approaching these kinds of things with as much respect as possible, given especially, like, the time that she was living. Yeah. For reasons I don't know. She was the only person in her family to go by a hyphenated uh, Courtney Latimer last name. A lot of the rest of her family just went by Latimer or her sisters when they had sons would put Latimer or would put Courtney as like the son's middle name. Uh, But she made it her hyphenated last name, uh, which I liked. I don't know why I like that. I just did. (laughs) Um, I also needed, I needed her, her colleague, JLB Smith. I needed him to calm down. I get it. I have absolutely worried myself into sleeplessness over something that was within my control, well, not within my control in any way. <laughs> but his letters to her are so overwhelming in how worried he is about the fish guts. And I understand the reasons for being upset about it, but I just feel like being in her position, getting a letter that's like, you must preserve the fish's viscera, and it's like, it's too late. Like, they were rotten. We didn't have anywhere to store 125-pound fish's viscera (laughs) and keep it. Like, I was doing my best. It's clear that she was doing her best, and it's also clear that as he understood like, was catching up with the situation as it unfolded, that he also understood that she did her best. Yeah. She she did her best. Like, he never... None of the letters that I read came across as criticizing her once he knew what the situation was. Mm -hmm. Like, he doesn't seem... He never said anything to her that was like, you are so bad at your job for having... Like, none of it was ever like that. Saying that it was the biggest tragedy to zoology, I was like, you didn't really need to put that in writing. Uh, But he does seem to have been, once he understood the situation, like, hey, you really did your best and in a lot of ways did more than a person could reasonably be expected to do. You found a way to preserve this 125 or however many pound fish in the summer over Christmas in a place where there wasn't refrigeration for it. Right, and no one wanted to help. And no one wanted to help because everybody was like, I don't want that stinky fish. Her account of it was definitely like, this fish was literally alive this morning. It does not stink. It will stink if you don't let me put it in the morgue. <laughs> so anyway, um, I love her. I do like that Smith, when it came to other people criticizing her, was very publicly vocal about, no, no, you do not understand. Yeah. You know, at a time when 
uh, it was probably very easy and natural for other people in that field to presume that she was a foolish woman, ding dong, who didn't handle it right, to have like somebody that was respected and male to go like, no, you're all wrong. You don't understand. <laughs> I named the fish for her because she did so much. She's the reason we have this. We, yeah. the, it's the reason we have any of the fish at all. Well, and I would love for him to have pointed out, like, the first the first dude that she talked to about it was like, ah, it's just a fish. I'm going on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> I also, we've already rerun the the episode on the Piltdown Man hoax. Uh-huh. Uh, we have already run that as a Saturday classic. Um, but you know, when I was when I was reading uh, about all of this and I, you know, found this article uh where what was that guy's name? Arthur Smith Woodward. I want to say that's what his name was. I scrolled past it in my outline. Um yeah, when I found that he had written this where he was this article where he was like, because its value is not appreciated, only the exterior. And I was like, yeah, that's not what happened, Arthur Smith Woodward. Also, you don't know this yet, but you have no room to be casting aspersions on anybody else's judgment. You're going to be real discredited before long. Yeah, you <laughs> told everyone that the skull that was pieced together with dental putty was the missing link. Um so you don't you don't get to you know uh try to to subtly shame right a woman museum curator in your papers. You are not the arbiter of good specimen judgment. Really not. Super not. Um, anyway, I keep saying I love her. I really do. Do you um, love her? I do. I love her. <laughs> uh, I kept finding things where I was like, oh, and this is also great. Nursing uniforms to just being like, all right, I'm not going to be a nurse anymore, but I made all these uniforms. So that's what I'm going to wear for so my first two years. So now this is my personal style. <laughs> my personal style is, uh, is that. I, I, it does kind of mystify me a little bit that people were like, yeah, we are going to trust this seven-year-old judgment about which mushrooms are safe to eat. But apparently she did know by that point which mushrooms were safe to eat. So anyway, uh, I am very glad that I stopped being sort of preemptively concerned about the av- availability of information uh, and finally got her up to the top of the list. Love it. Love it. This is your weekend coming up. You know, if you like to go out into the woods and look at bird nests and stuff, I hope you get to do a whole lot of that. And if not, if you're an indoor kid, I hope there is some great video game or book reading in your future. Uh, We'll be back with a Saturday classic tomorrow and something brand new on Monday. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 